Please give her a very warm welcome, Dr. Emily Schuckburg. <laughs> welcome, Emily. Thanks. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to speak to you um, this morning. So this apparently unremarkable stone is in fact the oldest object in the British Museum in London. It's a chopping tool from Africa, um, made almost two million years ago, and it's the first ever technology invention. The ability to make and use tools is of course the skill that sets us apart from other animals. And so this object essentially marks the very start of the journey of humankind. But at no point on that journey have our forebears lived in a world with atmospheric carbon dioxide as high as it is today. To find equivalent levels of carbon dioxide, you have to go back at least a million years more. And very soon we're going to exceed the levels for at least 15 million years. So today's atmosphere is unprecedented throughout human history, prehistory, and beyond. Now, ice cores extracted from the Antarctic ice sheet provide their own unique museum of the past. As the snow falls in Antarctica, it piles up layer upon layer, year after year, and it traps with it tiny bubbles of air from the time at which the snow formed. And you can see here a slice through an ice core with those little bubbles of air. And that means that as we drill down through the ice in Antarctica, we're able to recover ancient air from the past and analyze it. And that reveals how the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere have varied over the past million years. And that's what you can see in this graph here, fluctuating between about 180 and 280 parts per million as the world has moved in and out of ice ages as the orbit of the Earth about the sun has slowly varied. But an extremely rapid post-industrial revolution spike has put today's levels of carbon dioxide at an incredible 405 parts per million. You can see that sharp increase at the edge of that graph. It's an increase of approaching 50% over the past 150 years. And you can see very clearly, I think, from this data that this current change lies vastly outside the natural cycle of change. So what's driven that dramatic change? Since 1850, global population has grown enormously. Society in many countries of the world has been transformed, as indicated by a hundredfold increase in global GDP. Much of that transformation has been driven by industrialization, primarily through the use of fossil fuels for energy. And you can see a dramatic increase in global energy use. At the same time, we've been cutting down forests to make ways for settlements and farming. And both these activities generate carbon dioxide. Now, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, and so if we increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we would expect the surface temperature of the Earth to increase. And indeed, that is what has been observed. There's been about a one degree increase in temperature since the late 19th century. As the ocean waters have warmed, they've expanded in volume, and together with melting ice from the polar ice sheets and glaciers of the world, this has raised sea levels, and you can again see that in the data shown here. But these global average numbers mask important regional differences. The Arctic has seen the greatest warming, shown by the red in this plot here. And that's really impacted the daily lives of the people who live there. I visited Iqaluit in the Canadian Arctic a few years ago and was told by some of the people there that it's as if a, a friend that we could trust is suddenly acting strangely because they were so perturbed by the changes that they could see around them. The extent of Arctic sea ice is 
plummeting. Today, September sea ice at the end of the summer melt season covers less than two-thirds of the area than at the end of the 20th century. That's a drop equivalent to the area of the United Kingdom, Ireland, France, Germany, Spain, and Italy put together in just a couple of decades. The population weighted average temperature, which accounts for where people live, has been increasing at about twice the rate of the global average. Moreover, a modest increase in average temperature can translate to a large increase in the risk of extreme heat. Extreme heat, especially when combined with hu high humidity, can prove deadly for vulnerable people, especially the elderly or the very young. And it's estimated that 30%, almost a third of the global population, is now exposed to potentially deadly heat each year. Evaluation of recent extreme weather events has re revealed numerous cases, highlighted in orange here, where the risk of occurrence has increased as a consequence of the climate change we've already seen to date. And that raises questions both about how to adapt and also questions about liability. A warmer atmosphere holds more water, increasing the risk of heavy rainfall and resulting in flooding, such as that that has caused billions of pounds worth of damage in the UK in recent years. Hurricanes provide a stark reminder of the power of nature to wreak devastation, resulting in tragic loss of life and billions of dollars of damage. The mechanics of how they interact with a changing climate is complex. But it's clear that increases in heavy rainfall combined with sea level rise can exacerbate the storm surge um, induced flooding that results when you have a hurricane. In 2016, a severe drought in southern Africa resulted in millions requiring humanitarian assistance. And the other side of the world, in Southeast Asia, temperatures in Thailand soared above 40 degrees centigrade. These two events were connected through El Nino, but exacerbated by climate change. The systemic risks from such correlated events can easily be underestimated. Climate disruption is causing shifts in the conditions that sustain many wildlife species, from emperor penguins to red grouse in the Scottish Highlands. For some species, further climate change may push them to extinction with knock-on effects throughout the food web. Coral reefs are vulnerable to warming seas and to ocean acidification from increased carbon dioxide emissions. Comparable rates of acidification were last seen 250 million years ago when the greatest mass extinction of species on Earth occurred. A tipping point might be crossed unless temperature increase is limited to 1.5 degrees centigrade. This would be an economic as well as an environmental threat. Healthy coral reefs support fisheries and tourism and contribute billions of dollars each year to the global economy. There's also a great concern about the risk of catastrophic shocks to the system, black swan events. We know that dramatic and, um, re dramatic and rapid change in regional temperature can occur. There are more than 20 examples of this in the North Atlantic region over the last 100,000 years. The graph here shows an ice core sample from Greenland towards the end of the last ice age. And you can see in the middle of that graph there are abrupt swings in temperature of 10 degrees centigrade in a decade or less. Recent millennia have been characterized by unusual stability, but it's clear that as the temperature increases, the risk of triggering these sorts of black swan events increases. The recent IPCC report made clear that irreversible loss of the vast ice sheets covering <laughs> Greenland and West Antarctica could be triggered at around 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade of warming. 
as we know has happened in the past. The Greenland ice sheet has seen substantial ice loss in many recent years, and the West Antarctic ice sheet is vulnerable to warm water encroaching underneath it. And in fact, colleagues of mine are in Antarctica right at the moment investigating one of the key glaciers that is central to the stability of the West Antarctic ice sheet, and which there is already evidence may be in a reversible retreat. Such changes to the polar ice sheets would eventually lead to metres of sea level rise, transforming global coastlines. A map of some of the world's growing megacities shows the majority are in coastal regions. Just a few tens of centimetres of sea level rise, especially in combination with heavy rain and storm surges, could destroy infrastructure and displace hundreds of millions of people. A polar ice sheet collapse would be catastrophic and leads to the question whether people are really fully accounting for these risks in their development planning and scenario analyses. So let me now turn to the scale and the urgency of the challenge of responding to climate change. Despite the temperature goals agreed in Paris, Current national pledges have us on a path to three degrees of warming and rising by the end of the century, shown by the red curve in this graph. Indeed, at the current rates of warming, we are due to exceed 1.5 degrees centigrade of warming sometime between 2030 and 2050. Substantially increased ambition is required to put us on a blue trajectory to limit the rise to 1.5 degrees. The amount of carbon dioxide that can be released before dangerous levels of warming are reached can be seen as a carbon budget. It is estimated that our emissions since 1870 already amount to over 2,000 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide. The remaining budget to allow a good chance of staying below 1.5 degrees is estimated to be just over 400 billion tonnes, much, much less than we have already emitted. Our current rate of emissions is about 42 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide per year. So you can do the very simple arithmetic to see that we have just over 10 years or so left at our current rate of emissions before we blow the budget for 1.5 degrees. This graph shows our current trajectory of carbon dioxide emissions in white and a set of pathways of future emissions that are consistent with limiting temperature to 1.5 degrees. There is no escaping. Transformational change is required starting today. We need to return to the emissions levels of 1980 by around 2030 and to reach net zero by around 2050. Moreover, Reversing ocean acidification and limiting ongoing sea level rise is likely to require a commitment to net negative carbon dioxide emissions in the long term, finding ways of actively taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So I started this presentation with um, the object invented by early humans that led us as a species to becoming the dominant influence on Earth. If our society is to thrive and prosper long into the future, we must use our ingenuity to find ways of living in harmony with the world that sustains us. And that means each of us taking responsibility individually and collectively, because otherwise the security of future generations um, will be at risk. It depends on the decisions that we make today. Thank you.